Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. This is awesome. Like I was saying, it's way not the smallest crowd I ever spoke to. But we have everybody on the stream. So thank you so much for joining online today. And hopefully, you're going to enjoy this presentation. My name is Laurent Bunion. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. I work for Azure. And we are going to take a deep dive in durable functions. So I want to warn you in advance, if you have never heard about Azure Functions, this session is probably not for you. And I'm not offended if you decide to leave, right? Um, however, if you have heard, we are still going to do a quick recap, just so that we understand what durable functions bring to the landscape that you cannot fulfill with normal, with normal functions, all right? Cool, so on the agenda today, we are going to start with a brief recap, like I said, about normal Azure Functions, if you want. And then after that, we'll understand why we want to use durable functions to solve certain scenarios. We'll check how those durable functions even work, all right? And then we'll check also some patterns that you can fulfill using those functions. That's going to be more or less roughly the first half of the presentation. But then after that, we'll go into tips and tricks. And I've been using durable functions for about a year to solve some problems that could be very difficult to solve otherwise at Microsoft, uh, specifically to build some web, some parts of Microsoft.com. So I'm going to show you that. Uh, and in the process of this year, I made a lot of mistakes. And I really want you to not make those mistakes. So I'm going to show you what I did and why it didn't work, and then the workaround. Cool. So Azure Functions. You know, before I said in the, you were there, right? I said that my favorite service is probably static web apps in Azure. Static web apps can actually use Azure Function, and Azure Function is probably, if not my second favorite service on Azure, but it's, it, I mean, it's very close, right? Like first, second, uh, I really love Azure Functions. I use them all the time. And Azure Functions essentially are a part of the serverless offerings that we have at Microsoft. Old joke, serverless doesn't mean there is no server. It means there is less server. You have to worry less about the server. So essentially, you don't have to worry about deploying the server, about maintaining the server, about putting an antivirus on it, about updating the operating system when you need to. You don't worry about all that. We take care of that for you. Okay, That's kind of the idea. So you're going to worry only about your code, deploying your code, adding features to your code, and that's pretty much it. It's also going to scale on demand. What it means is that if you're a startup and you have just like two users per week, you're pretty much going to pay nothing because you're still into the, the free tier of the Azure function. So it's very good to experiment and to try things out. But if suddenly, let's say that you have a celebrity retweeting a tweet of yours, and then suddenly you have millions of users, no problem, we are just going to throw web, uh, virtual machines at you, and then we are going to scale uh, out, and we are going to just handle those requests. Then you're going to start paying, but it's OK, because you're also going to start selling. So you know it's only fair that at some point uh, you give us back a little bit of money. I have kids who need to eat, right? So it still means that those functions are going to be cheap to run, because when, uh, especially in the serverless model, in the consumption model, when you don't use them, you're not paying for them. Those functions go to sleep. And keep that in mind, because we are going to use that later to illustrate why durable functions. Those functions go to sleep, and you don't pay for them. You're going to pay a little bit for the Azure storage, basically where your code is stored. But this is really like cents per month. It's really uh, not very much. And the uh, runtime itself, we are going to bill you by the second. So. Uh, if the function runs for uh, you know, uh, 1 hour and 55 seconds, we are not going to bill you for 2 hours. We bill you for that time. So on the long term, they are really uh, cheaper to run than other comparable services. Now, Azure functions are not the only serverless offerings that we have on Azure. We have tons of services that are either serverless by nature or can run in a serverless mode. For example, we have Logic Apps. Logic Apps are a serverless workflow that you can build using uh, building blocks. So it's a no-code or low-code scenario. Uh, we have uh, Kubernetes services, AKS, which can run in a serverless mode. Azure Cosmos DB as well also has a serverless mode. So when I say serverless mode, essentially what it means is that when you don't use it, you don't pay for it. That's kind of what it means. Okay. Uh, we have Signal R that I just demonstrated earlier on, uh, which is a service that you can also deploy in, uh, in, in uh, consumption mode, in serverless mode. Uh, Static Web App is also a serverless offering, et cetera, et cetera. And so why do we want to use durable functions in certain scenarios? Well, it's basically to answer cases that normal functions cannot fulfill. Okay. 
So the issue that you have with normal Azure function in consumption mode, in serverless mode, are pretty well known these days. First of all, because we don't bill you when you don't use them, what it means is that we're going to put them to sleep, in quotation marks, all right? And when they wake up, it takes a little bit, like just a few seconds to rehydrate, to, to, to wake up if you want. Now, our engineers have worked really hard in reducing that time. And these days, it's actually pretty good. But still, if you want to do some absolutely real, you know, real-time observation, for example, of, a, of an IoT landscape of devices, this small rehydration time can be a problem, okay? So you need to take that into account. Another thing is a timeout. Functions, after a while, they, gave, they give up. So if you have a long-running operation, and by the way, this timeout in consumption mode is between five and 10 minutes, all right? If you take another plan, like we have a premium plan, then it's a little bit higher. It can go up to half an hour. But if you have some operations which take longer than that, at some point, the function is going to give up, okay? So you need to keep that in mind when you architect your system. Also, another thing is that functions essentially are stateless. You never know what machine they are going to run on, all right? Um, you cannot take advantage of local files or anything. Also, if a function has an error, that can be tricky to handle, okay? Especially if you want multiple functions, if you want to run multiple functions uh, in a chain, for example, and then one of them has an error, it's kind of hard to notify the next one that, you know, maybe it shouldn't run, for example. So that is a little bit tricky to coordinate. So what is the scenario that I used where I first decided, okay, I'm going to try durable functions now? So if you go to docs.microsoft.event, uh, doc.microsoft.com slash event, sorry, this is a, a new part of Microsoft.com that we built to host all of our first party events, uh, Ignite, Build, etc. And essentially, uh, this is where we archive all the videos on demand. So if you go there, you're going to find, for example, the videos from Ignite March. Now, if you go to the official Ignite website, the videos from March are not there anymore, okay? So this is a place where we archive them. We, and we plan on continuing to archive uh, videos. And essentially, if you go to, um, to our video website, you can still see video from 2006, from Mix, for example, the first conferences we had, etc. because those videos really have value, right? So we decide to keep them. So my boss came to me and said, hey, we have about three weeks until Ignite March 2021. We want to build that thing, and we want to use the docs infrastructure. So all of our documentation at Microsoft runs on docs.microsoft.com. And the way that it's built is actually pretty clever. It is all backed, backed by some GitHub repository. And in there, you author your pages using Markdown or YAML. And then you push, you commit to, uh, to, to GitHub, and that's going to start a build process, which is going to take all that and then build a private version of your page that only you with your, your, your well, basically any Microsoft employee can see. And then when you merge, when you do a pull request and you merge into a branch, which we call live, that's going to be pushed to public. Okay, we merge with a review typically. So that means that we have some security. We have a four eye principle where at least two people need to see the page before it goes live. So that allows you to build new websites, new web pages on Microsoft very fast. And also it opens the door to a lot of automation, all right, which is very interesting. So what I decided to do in the three weeks that I had, I built an automation system which is using the uh, GitHub REST API to go and create a new branch and commit to that new branch. That creates a private version of the pages, and then it allows me to check them out quickly and then merge into live to go public, okay? The last step, the last merge, I still do it manually. I could do it automatically as well, but I do it manually because I like to have a last verification before I push things to Microsoft.com, right? That's kind of a <laughs> bad career move, depending what you do, okay? So this is cool. Um, but the problem that I have is that those changes to the, to the flow of events that I get from the API where you have all the, all the sessions uh, defined, that happens approximately every half an hour because the, the average duration of a session at Ignite is half an hour. So every half an hour I need to go and pull the uh, API which gives me a big JSON file with everything that I have. Then I need to build those markdown pages and then compare with GitHub to check if there are some changes. If there are some changes, I'm going to commit, 
And then I'm going to send notifications to team and to my phone to tell me, hey, we have 10 new pages that, or 10 pages that changed that you need to go and check, all right? And the problem, of course, at Ignite, we can have up to 300 sessions, okay? So I have 300 pages that I need to build every half an hour, okay? So this is a lot of stuff, and, and it could be way worse, right? I could have thousands of pages, etc. So this is the problem I wanted to solve. This is another view of the pages that I'm building. So for every video, I have also helper pages, like landing pages and, and others. And uh, the way that I decided to make this work, or the way that durable functions work, really, is that you're going to have a trigger. And this trigger is going to be an Azure function. Okay? It could be an HTTP function, could be a timer function. In my case, every half an hour, I'm running that. And this trigger function is going to start another function, which is a special function called an orchestrator. This special function, and we are going to see all that in code later, this special function orchestrator is then going to start an activity function, the one that actually does the work. It's going to wait until the activity completes. Then when the activity completes, the orchestrator is going to be called again, and it's going to start the next activity. And then when it's completed, it's going to go back to the orchestrator and then start the next activity. Right? I made this slide yesterday in the plane. It's pretty, right? Because before I had everything handwritten, so it's better this way. And then after that, the orchestrator starts again, a last time to basically check if everything was done and clean up, and then return the result. Okay? So that's how those durable functions work. So, I want to also mention that it's not the only way to run workflows on Azure or at Microsoft.com for that matter. If you use Power Automate or if you use Logic Apps, this is also some workflow coordination, some workflow orchestration. But those use a block programming language, which essentially you don't have code there, all right? It's aimed at other people, not necessarily at developers. So if you want to use code to orchestrate your workflow, then the durable functions are probably a good choice, okay? Good, so let's understand those patterns and what you can solve using those durable functions. So imagine that you have this problem. You want to start a function F1, and then when F1 is finished, you want to save the state somewhere, and then you want to start another function F2, save the state, function F3, etc., etc. Now that is something that you can absolutely solve using normal functions. You can use a normal function with a system of queues, and then the queue trigger another function, etc., and then you save the state. But if you do that with a normal function, let's imagine that F2 suddenly has an error. It's kind of hard to notify F3 that something happened, right? So you need to really think very carefully about your, about your scenario. So this is very easy to use uh, with durable function, and we are going to see a demo in a few seconds. The other scenario which is very, very popular is what we call fan out, fan in, all right? So basically it means the orchestrator is going to prepare a set of functions. Think about my 300 function instances that I want to run to create websites, cr to create web pages. And then it's going to run them all together. And literally we are going to throw 300, uh, 300 instances of functions to you, right? Of course we are going to bill you accordingly as well. You, we bill you for when they run. And then after that, the orchestrator is going to wait until, typical scenario, until all functions are completed. But since it's code, you can wait for any event. You can say, I want to wait until the first is complete, for example, and then I want to move on. And the cool thing is that you can combine your, um, you know, your function chaining with your fan out, fan in. And of course, you can say, all right, first I want to do something, then I want to do 300 things at the same time, then I want to finish with something else, and that all works. One thing which is interesting to know is that because we want to optimize the cost, when the orchestrator starts an activity, the orchestrator is going to go to sleep. And that's important to understand some of the tricks that I'm going to show you later. It can be very confusing when you debug, all right? What it means is that you pay only for the function which is running. So the orchestrator goes to sleep, you don't pay for that. When the activity is finished, the orchestrator is start starting again, you're going to be billed for that time. And then it starts the other activity, it goes back to sleep, and then you don't pay for the orchestrator. So you don't pay twice, which is a nice scenario, but also a very confusing scenario like we will see in the demo. Okay, so let's take a look <coughs> at the demo. No, Google, I didn't talk to you. All right. 
So let's take a look at the demo. And what I did is that I prepared here a solution. And by the way, everything I'm going to show you today is in .NET, because this is a language that I know and love. I've been using .NET for more than 20 years now. But everything I tell you, or most of what I tell you, also applies to uh, Java, to JavaScript, basically to the other frameworks that you can use for durable functions. Right? So keep that in mind. So here I have this solution. And by the way, you'll get the repo at the end. And let's start with the function chaining. And what we're going to do is explore a little bit how this works. And this is pretty much out of the box what you get when you create a new durable function. OK, so let's understand how this works. So first of all, we are going to enter here this function, which I call function chaining HTTP start. So typically, I use a naming convention where the orchestrator function, which is up here, I give it the same name as the class because this is really the function that kind of fulfills the whole thing. Then my activity functions, usually I give them the name of the class and a, a unique name, because you, you don't want to have confusions, right? You don't want to have two functions in the same application with the same name. And then my HTTP start, or my whatever start, I gave it, an a, again, the name of the class and, um, and uh, HTTP start, or whatever start that is. I guess it allows me to find them easily when I look at the list of functions. OK. So this is a start. Which, this is what's going to trigger the whole workflow. It's an HTTP call. It's going to use a root 01. So I'm going to say slash API slash 01. OK, it's a get. And you see that it gets here an iDurable orchestration client from the framework. And using this orchestrator, it's going to start here the orchestrator function. And then it's going to return. It's going to go to sleep. Now, in the orchestrator function, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to prepare a list of outputs, which is a list of string. In that case, it could be a list of anything, really. And then I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to add to this output the result of an activity which is called function chaining say hello and which uses this parameter. And again, the parameter could be anything, small caveats, anything that you can serialize. We'll come back to that in a moment. So here, because I have an await, it's going to wait for the result. And then only it's going to execute the second function with a different parameter. And that's the chaining that I was saying before. It's going to wait for the result. And then it's going to run the third one. So this is here the uh, activity function. It's going to just return hello and then the name, and then do some log. So let's run this, and let's see what happens. So this is starting here. The function application. I'm going to try to put this side by side on this small screen. And here I'm going to trigger the function from VS Code using an extension called REST Client. It's a pretty cool extension, which allows me to just define the request like that. OK, so now I have some breakpoints. So if I start the function chaining, you see that I am into my HTTP trigger. OK, now I'm going to press F5 to go. And that's going to execute the orchestrator. The orchestrator is going to call the first activity function. Here I am into the first activity function. And now if I press F5, what do you think will happen? You see I have a breakpoint here on line 28. That's where I should jump, right? That's kind of the next step. But don't forget, the orchestrator is sleeping right now because you don't want to pay for it. So if I press F5, you jump back at the beginning. That's super confusing the first time you do durable function. The orchestrator runs again, but this time, it's going to go to the first call. And the first call has a unique signature. It has a name here and then the parameter. And then it's not going to run that function, because I already ran it. The result has been serialized somewhere. I get it. And then I'm going to run the second activity function, this time with the parameter CL. Let's press F5. I go back in the orchestrator in the beginning. I'm going to check the result of the first one. I already ran it. That's fine. Check the result of the second one. I already ran it. That's fine. And now I'm going to run the third one. And then I go back in the beginning again. And then now I have run everything, and so I can return my output. OK, you see the flow? So again, because we put the orchestrator to sleep to save you money, that's a little bit of a weird flow that you need to keep in mind. And there is some serialization happening, which is another thing you need to keep in mind. OK? So to understand what happened a little bit better, here 
I have the same thing except that here I sleep 10 seconds in each activity function. Because I want to show you something which is pretty cool. If I go here, you see I get a 202 accepted. That's the response that I get from the HTTP start. I get that immediately. And then the HTTP starts goes to sleep. But I also get some URLs. And so let's try to run the second one, which is going to sleep a little bit, OK? So here it started. Now it's sleeping. And now I can go here, and in my response, I can take this URL, which is called status query get URI. And I'm going to open it in a web browser. And here I, I get an information about the flow. And it says runtime status running. It's not done yet, OK? You can interrogate that as many times as you want. And if I go back here to my flow, I have Tokyo, I have Seattle, I'm still waiting for London. Now I have London. Now I can go back here, and now it is completed, and it's going to give me back the result, OK? Now, typically, this is not how you obtain the result. Typically, what durable functions do is that they go and serialize something somewhere to a database, to a blob storage, to GitHub, to wherever. OK, that's typically what you expect. But it is interesting that you have this API which allows you to interrogate. The other things you can do in the API here, in the response that you get, you can send an event to your function application and do stuff. So that's going to be added to a queue, and then you can trigger stuff. So that can be interesting if you want to influence the way that your application is running. You can terminate the execution. So if you have something which is not working fine, and then you want to terminate it, you can use this URI. You can also go and purge the history. Now, keep that in mind, because later I'll show you that functions, durable functions, have a history. And that can be tricky to solve. Okay? So here, by clicking here, you can go and purge that. And then you can also restart the execution of a function application. OK. So that is the normal flow of a function chaining. Now let's see how the fan out, fan in works. So for fan out and fan in, in the orchestrator, here I'm going to create a new list of task of string. And again, this string here could be anything. It just needs to be the same as the parameter of the call activity async. And it needs to be the same than the return value of the activity function. Anything that is serializable can be used. So I'm going to do this list of task of. And here I'm going to add. And notice that this time I don't have an await. I just call context.callActivityAsync. That's going to give me back a task which is not executed yet. And now I'm going to save that with the name Tokyo here. Now I'm going to add another one and another one. And those activities here, they don't have to be the same activities. They can have any activity that you have as long as the return value matches. So in my case, where I'm building different websites, different web pages, I'm saying, OK, so I have one activity which is going to create the landing page, the index. And then I have another activity which is going to create all the, uh, all the, the, the particular web pages with the video player. Okay? And then when I'm ready, I'm going to call task, I'm going to await task.whenAll. And again, here I do when all, but I could do when any, which is going to wait for the first one to complete and then continue. Here I'm waiting for all of them to complete. Does that make sense? So to make things interesting here, I added a random. So I'm saying, all right, for each execution here, I'm going to wait between 5 and 10 seconds in a random manner. So now if I run this, and actually it's already running, and I go here and start the fan out, fan in. So now we see what's going on, right? I have the, f the three tasks are being executed, but right now they are waiting for a random time. And then I'm going to have hello to Seattle, hello to Tokyo, hello to London. Seattle, Tokyo, London. If I run again, again, they are all executing. They are waiting for a random time. So before I had Seattle, Tokyo, London. And now I'm going to have uh, Seattle, London, Tokyo. So different result. Okay? But it doesn't matter. My orchestrator is just going to wait for all three to complete whatever time they need. Not quite true. They need to stay in the timeout period. This is still an Azure function between 5 and 10 minutes. But it means that I can break my problem in small pieces. And I can run all those tasks simultaneously. 
And if you need one million of those, we are going to give you one million of those. You're also going to pay for those one millions, right? So you need to keep that in mind. But it is running in a very efficient manner. For the small story, when I run my 300 pages on my local machine, it takes about half an hour to complete because it's going to run in a serialized. My machine only has a number of core and it cannot multi-thread as much as the servers we have on Azure. But if I run this on Azure, it takes about two minutes to complete. So I go from 30 minutes to two minutes, which is a really nice gain, right? And uh, keep in mind that my half an hour long task, I need to run it every half an hour. So basically my machine could not do anything else during that time. Okay, so that's a nice scenario. Good, so let's go back to the slides. Because actually we have uh, also other patterns that you can implement using functions. But to be honest, the two that I showed you are probably the ones you're going to use the most, I think, because this is really where it makes sense when you want a workflow. But you can also use durable functions for things like when you want to monitor, like to have a long running task and you want to monitor the status, you want to check from time to time what are you doing, what are you doing, etc. So you can absolutely have your function serialize some state, have another function get that state and return that to the caller and see what's going on. Another scenario we have is basically monitoring stuff. Right? So you have something in the field which is happening, you want to get this information, build a dashboard, that's a great scenario for a durable function. When you have a human interaction, this is an interesting one because you don't know how long the human is going to take to answer. And you don't want to pay for the time that you're waiting, so that's a good scenario for, a, for a, an orchestrator like that as well. Uh, when you have some uh, aggregation of state, right? You're, you're, you're basically gathering a whole lot of things. And if you go to the page, at the end I'll give you the link to the documentation page. We are detailing all those patterns a little bit better in detail so that you understand. But essentially what I want to say is durable functions are great when you have a long running task that you want to break in smaller portions. Or when you have a lot of things that you want to execute in parallel. Or every time you want to monitor something and you don't exactly know when the events are going to arrive. This is kind of the scenarios in which durable functions make a lot of sense. So let's go into the tips and tricks and talk a little bit about those mistakes I made and how hopefully you're not going to do the same. So we are going to talk about a few things. The first thing is non-deterministic execution. Essentially, each function is running, I'm going to say a trendy buzzword, as a microservice, right? It is completely isolated from the others. And it needs to run this way, which means that there are a few things that you shouldn't do. Another thing you, keep, you have to keep in mind, which is important to understand what's going on here, is that, again, the orchestrator goes to sleep. But because of the way that the, the Azure function applications are architected, when it wakes up again, there is absolutely zero guarantee that it's going to be on the same machine. In fact, it could be in a totally different building. It could even potentially be, depending on how you architect your thing, in a different country. Okay? You don't know. So you can't rely on stuff which is local. Okay? Then the other thing is what happens when you have errors in your application. And also, how do you handle the history? And that is really something that can be super, super confusing when you debug. And I don't know if it's going to happen today. It's kind of random, the way that it happens. But an orchestrator hates when a task is not complete. It wants to finish it. And it's going to remember, because when you break the execution of an activity function, and that's typically what you do when you debug, right? You debug press F, uh, you know, F5, F5, F10, F10, and then suddenly you're like, oh, wait, I did a whoopsie here, I need to, to fix it. You stop, then you go, and then you start again. What is your orchestrator going to be, to do? It's going to go and check the queues. It's going to say, oh, you didn't finish before. Let's run again right where you were. And this is like extremely confusing when you debug. I'm going to show you how you can clear that up. Another thing is serialization. So, this is really a keyword in Azure Functions. And when you use JavaScript, it's kind of easier because you know, JavaScript, JSON is kind of you know, uh, native to, to JavaScript if you want. But if you use any other language which is using a JSON serializer, then there are some things that you need to you know, keep in mind. And uh, that can be tricky. And so the serialization is what happens every time that the function goes to sleep, it's going to serialize its state in Azure Storage. I'm going to show you that in a second. And then when the function starts, it's going to get its state from the same Azure Storage. And this is all in JSON format. 
Another, another thing you shouldn't do is wait in the orchestrator. But you're going to tell me, oh, but you just waited on the execution of the function in the orchestrator. Yes, but that function was special. That task was created by the orchestrator context. That's OK. But if you await something else, like an HTTP client, your application is going to crash. I'm going to show you how you can work around that. And then debugging, because it can be very difficult to debug who has ever debugged multi-threaded applications. Raise your hand. Yeah, do, do, do you like it? It's really fun, no? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what happens. Essentially, you have everything happening at the same time. And, and keeping track is really tricky. So I'm going to show you a small trick I use to make things a little bit easier when I debug. All right, so let's go back to the demo. We have half an hour for that, more or less. It's absolutely perfect. So let's go back to our application here. And the first thing I want to show you is a non-deterministic thing. So here I have my orchestrator. And my orchestrator is going to get an environment variable named username. That's, the use, that's my username on this Windows machine. And then I'm going to use that to call my activity function. OK? So if I run this here, I'm going to get here the variable. My username is Elbunion. That's good. That's my alias. Then I'm going to call the, um, the activity function. When the activity function is complete, I'm going to go back into the orchestrator in the beginning. Then I'm going to get the environment variable again. And here, because I'm running this on my local machine, the username is the same. But if you run this on Azure, there is absolutely zero guarantee that it's going to be the same username. It could be anything, really. Okay? If you're getting things which are time dependent, that's going to be a different value. And then what's going to happen if you try to call the activity async with a different value? Well, it's going to start a new activity because it's going to say, oh, that's a totally different state. Right? So you don't want to do that. In fact, in some scenarios, you're going to get a warning in the output telling you you shouldn't do that. But let's face it, who reads those? Now, the thing you don't want to do is this. And <laughs> it may sound logical after everything I told you, but this is actually a line taken from a code review that I gave to someone you know, a few weeks ago. In a function, you don't file dot append all text, or you don't file dot write all, or you don't do anything with local files, because you don't know the machine it's going to run on. This machine, as soon as the function is done, it's going to be discarded, and we are going to use it for something else. Right? Don't save stuff locally. What you want to do is save stuff in a well-known place, which is remote, could be a database, could be whatever. So if I run this, I'm going to have some, actually, it's going to run, but I'm going to have some issue. I'm going to stop it, because it might help me to illustrate another point I want to make. Then I'm going to restart. OK, and then I'm going to show you the deterministic code. So the deterministic code here, this is a way that you can actually code these kind of things in a safe way, is that the first thing you're going to be to do in the uh, in the starter, all right, in the, in the trigger, you're going to get the information that you want to get. And here it's safe to do environment.get environment variable. I kind of question the usage of username on Azure, but you know, if you want, you can do that. Then you're going to save that into a class, which I'm going to give to my orchestrator as a parameter. That's going to be serialized. And then the orchestrator, every time that the orchestrator starts, it's going to obtain this value from the context. Deserialization, but the value is always going to be the same because it has been obtained only once. OK, so that makes sense. The other thing here is that when you save stuff, you should save to an online storage somewhere. Could be a database, could be an Azure table, it could be a blob storage, it could be GitHub, it could be whatever you want, but don't save things locally on your machine. OK? Good, so that's the deterministic example. That's the first example. Now let's move on to this fun thing, the, the error case. So here I have a case, for example, where you see I'm throwing an exception here, which essentially means I'm, going to, I'm not going to finish my task. I'm going to interrupt the task before it goes on, right? So let's go and run this. Here we go. So now I jump into the orchestrator, OK? The first time it's calling with Tokyo, I say the exception should be thrown only if it's Seattle. 
So the first time it's going to run fine. Now it comes back. I'm going to go to the second time. And now I'm going to have this exception, which is thrown. So here, typically, what I do is that I, I say, OK, I'm going to stop the execution and solve the problem when I debug. But then when I restart, like I said, it's very possible that my orchestrator is going to say, hey, you had something going on. Let's restart here, which means that essentially, even though I don't call the HTTP start, it's still going to trigger anyway. OK? So the way that it works is because when you create a new durable function application, you need to provide a storage account. And that's true for any function application, really, because we need some place to store the code at the very least. But here, in addition, we are going to store some queues. And those queues here, they have a specific name. They are called, in that case, test hub name. It could be another name, dash control, dash, and then you see that you have a number of those. Those queues are what the runtime is using to coordinate the orchestration. OK, so again, it's a stateless thing. The orchestrator, when it starts, it gets some state from the runtime. When it goes back to sleep, it saves stuff. It says, hey, I'm, I'm here in the execution. And then it goes to sleep, and then it forgets, right? And then it is rehydrated, and then it needs to start again getting the state. That's the first thing that we create. The other thing is that here in the container, so in the blob service, we also get here those two, which are applies and leases. OK? That's where the state is stored. That's where the JSON objects are being stored. All right? So when you run your code, it's going to go there. It's going to take it and say, oh, now I'm going to jump back, and then I'm going to execute again. And this is quite confusing. So I'm going to show you a quick trick. If you go into your host.json, and now depending on what, um, uh, what framework you implement your function with, it's going to be a different place. But this is always a place where you can configure your application. All right? Here I can actually add a configuration, which is going to say, all right, the name of the hub should be, and here you see I'm using percent, which means it should be an environment variable that you're going to get from the environment. OK, so that means that this host.json is going to be deployed to Azure. That you cannot change it when it's deployed. But what I can change is the configuration. And so in the configuration, I can say, all right, the generate document task hub, and I'm going to give it a name. And here you see I have 003. Let's go back to 001. And essentially, when I, run my, when I debug my code, but don't do that in production, right? When I debug my code, Sometimes when I see, oh, I need to interrupt a long running operation in the middle, I'm going to go and then I'm going to change that name. Like this, I know that I have a fresh slate. I restart fresh. Another way, which is actually supposed to be a cleaner way, is to use this purge history delete URI that you get when you execute. But I can guarantee you that you're not going to save those. <laughs> you're going to forget. And then when you actually need it, it's too late. And also, I had some cases where this URI actually didn't work. So it, I clicked, and then nothing happens. You know, it's tricky, right? So the other way is a safe way where you can go and you can say, all right, so now I'm going to use another hub name. So now if I run this and go and execute one of the function execution, all right, so I'm just going to wait that it starts, OK? Now, it's funny because when I, when I actually rehearsed that presentation, it kept jumping in the middle of an interrupted task, and I wanted to show you that, and now it doesn't. So, of course, that's the demo effect. But believe me, it will happen, right, when you debug. So now I started the application again. I'm going to execute one of the functions. Let's execute one, which is the function chaining, because it's a safe one to run. OK. Here, it has run. And now if I go back to my uh, container storage, I see that now I have a new one which is called test generate documents task hub 001 dash and then applies and leases. And if I go in the queue, I see that I have this one. If now I have the problem again that it's jumping left and right and I don't understand what's happening, no problem. I can go back to my Visual Studio. I can say in the configuration, and by the way, you can do that in the staging slot as well. Don't do that in production really, right? Because then you're going to lose state. But if you are in the, in the testing slot, you can also do that here. I'm in local settings of JSON. On Azure, it would be in the configuration of the function application. I can change the name. I can run again. OK. 
And when it trends again, if I go back here and refresh, now I should see that I have 002. And now at this point, I can safely say, oh, I can clean up. I'm going to remove everything which is 001. OK? Be careful when you delete stuff, because if you delete stuff but you didn't change the name, then your function is going to fail, and you can search for a long time <laughs> what happened now. OK? So this can be tricky. But essentially, now I say, all right, so my queues and my container, the ones that are 001, I'm not using them anymore. I can clean up. And again, please don't do that in production. That can be really tricky. So when you, st when you uh, deploy to production and you have a hub name, please stick to that hub name. Uh, it's very easy to break an application function, uh, function application, sorry, using these uh, kind of things where you go and delete stuff that you shouldn't. All right, so be careful. OK, so hopefully that illustrates a little bit better how those functions work. So let's go and see the serialization thing. So serialization, again, what I'm showing you here in JavaScript might not happen because JSON is kind of native to JavaScript, so it's a little bit easier. If you use Java and you use a serializer, then most probably you're going to have this kind of issue. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here. So what I'm doing is that instead of passing the name directly, I'm passing a class which has a property called name. And this is typically what you do. You pass a, you know, a set of information to your uh, activity function. And then after that, inside the activity function, I'm going, to, I'm going to shout at the user in uppercase. So I'm going to call info.name.toUpper. OK? So let's try and run this. And that case is also one case that I had to scratch my head a little bit. And when the function is ready, here, the function is ready, I'm going to call here uh, serialization. OK, so I jump into my code. I have my info class. I can go and inspect the name property. It's Tokyo. I'm going to execute. I jump into my activity function. And what happens? Oh, no, I have a null reference exception because my name is null. Well, if you have ever done anything with serialization in .NET, you probably know what happened. What happened here is that my setter is internal. And you cannot do that. If you serialize JSON in, Java, in uh, .NET, everything needs to be public. Internal means that the setter can be called by classes which are inside the same assembly. The serializer is not in the same assembly. So what it's going to do, it's going to serialize properly because the getter is public. But then when it writes back to the object, the setter being internal, it's not going to find it. It's going to give up without any warning, by the way. And then it's just not going to set it. I can tell you I scratched my head a little bit on that one. OK, so of course, obviously, the fix is to do that public. But if here I decide, hey, I'm going to be a very efficient programmer, and I want to add a new property and this property doesn't exist, but it's fine because I'm going to get some refactoring tool and I'm going to generate this property. Awesome, but when Visual Studio generates property, <laughs> it generates them as internal by default. And so you can really be, get beaten by that, especially when you're in the zone, right? And you're coding and you're refactoring and you're adding your stuff and then you forget to go and change it to public and then suddenly nothing works. So that is the thing to be careful about. So it's one of the serialization gotchas. Now, the other one is a little bit clearer. And this is a scenario that I do all the time. So I'm running this show called Learn Live on Microsoft Learn TV. OK, it's a thing I started. And because I'm running and my assignment was I need to scale things up, I was like, oh, cool, scale up means durable function. I'm going to generate tons of stuff using automation and durable functions. So I have a Learn Live series. And this Learn Life series has a list of Learn Life modules, which you are doing, of episodes, if you want. And typically, when I do that, because those Learn Life modules, they are going to create some documents, like some markdown, some emails, some meeting requests, some stuff. It's really easier if I have a link, a reference to the parent, to the series, because I'm going to want to get some information from the series. Now, in .NET, this is no problem at all, because it's all by reference. OK? It doesn't cost me anything. It just costs cost me a, a reference, a pointer, essentially. But when you try to run this, serialization, <laughs> the serializer is not going to be very happy, because I have 
uh, learn module who has a link to a parent, who has a link to all the learn module, who have a link to a parent, who have a link to all the learn module, who have a link to the parent, and you know, I'm not going to bore you and continue until the end, but essentially you see the problem, right? So if I go and run here the serialization recursion, okay, now I am inside my thing, so I'm going to, uh, where is F10 here? I'm going to instantiate my series, and then I'm going to call that, and oops, it's not jumping anywhere, and in fact, I have a whole lot of red. And the red is Newton surf the JSON, so I'm using, uh, basically the durable functions are using uh, JSON.NET in the background, and then it says, where is it now? Uh, Self-referencing loop detected for property parent with type blah, blah, blah. So essentially it says, oh, if there is a recursion happening, I cannot do that because that's going to generate an endlessly big uh, JSON file. So you cannot do that. So instead, what you're going to do is go inside your learn live module here. I'm going to say the parent, I'm going to mark it as JSON ignore, I'm going to say don't serialize that, okay? Which means that in my, um, oops, sorry, let's go back. In my uh, thing here, in the activity function, before I do work, I'm going to have to say, oh, for each module in the series, module.parent equals series. Here, there is no serialization within the function until, unless you write it yourself. So that is safe to do. But you need to keep that in mind because otherwise you're not going to be able to serialize your objects. Okay? So those are kind of the small gotchas which are caused by the fact that because the function go to sleep, there is a serialization system happening in the Azure storage. And then when it's rehydrated, it needs to run and that's going to be an issue unless you do these kind of tricks. Okay, so what else do we have? Await in orchestrator. Now, this one is a good one. So the orchestrator is a little bit of a special type of function. It's going to orchestrate a bunch of things, but it needs to do it in a specific manner. So here I have an orchestrator where I happily create an HTTP client, and I'm going to call an API, and then I'm going to use the result to run an activity function. Okay? Now, the problem here is that if I run this, if I run this, it's actually going to work, but it's going to protest a lot. And this is really not something you want to do. OK, so my function, hey, yay, see what happened? I didn't press anything. OK, straighter remembered, hey, you didn't finish. Then it jumped back. That's what I wanted to demonstrate. I should probably go and clean that state. OK? Sorry, totally not linked to the demo that I wanted to show you. But this is what I was hoping would happen at some point. Because again, this is like super confusing. And by the way, this is causing an exception, remember? So that is a problem, right? So at some point, I would probably have to go back. Oh, and you see now it's jumping here. I, again, I didn't touch anything, right? It's just the orchestrator saying, hey, you didn't finish this. You didn't finish that. That doesn't work. Oh, no. OK. I just press F5 in that case uh, because it should run. OK. Let's go back to the demo. Forget everything that you just saw in the past 15 seconds. We go back to the problem, which is I'm going to await in my orchestrator. OK? So let's go here. Now I'm inside my orchestrator. I'm going to go and call this API using the client, using the HTTP client. That actually works fine. But here I'm OK. But when I try the next await, which is this time await context, then all hell will break loose. And essentially what it says here, it says multi-threaded execution was detected. This can happen if the orchestrator function code awaits on a task that was not created by a durable orchestrating con uh, orchestration context method. That's a long error message, but let's give credit to the guys who wrote that. It's actually very descriptive. You know what happened. You cannot await on something else than the context tasks, OK? So instead, what do you want to do? Well, what you want to do is here, the first, in my orchestrator, on the first run, I'm going to call another activity. 
And in this other activity called call get random names, that's where I'm going to call my HTTP client and wait for the result. That's fine. I can wait on anything I want in the activity functions. Okay? When it returns, I'm going to run the orchestrator again. This time, I'm going to have a safe call to the storage to get the serialized value. And then I can pass that to my activity function. The other advantage of doing things this way is that this await here is going to be executed only once, the first time that the activity function is called. Okay? And then the next time that the orchestrator arrives at this line, it's going to get some serialized state from the storage, and then the await is not going to be called again. So it's also an optimization. Okay? So it makes sense to do things this way. And plus, you're not going to crash your application with a lot of red, which uh, is not my favorite color in a console application. All right? Good. Last example I want to show you. Now, this one is really fun when you try to run stuff. So I notice my breakpoints are messed up, so I'm going to put them back. So here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create 10 tasks. Notice that there is no await here. So I'm going to just create those tasks. And then I'm going to run them all in parallel. And then I'm going to try to understand what happens. Well, you know the two hardest things in programming are multi-threaded execution and naming stuff. Right? So here we are in the first scenario, which is really hard. OK, so let's. Uh, trigger that, so I'm going to go into the debugging, all right? Now I have created my 10 tasks. Notice that those tasks are in state waiting for activation, all right? They are not executed yet, they are waiting. It's a little bit small, but this is what it says here. And now if I run F5, now I jump into my activity function. Very cool. Now I press F5 again. Oh no, I'm in the same location, but for another function. I press F5 again, and oh no, I'm in the same place, but in another function. And so if I really want to debug pressing F5, at some point I'm going to jump in the end. Oh, now I'm here. But is it the first function that was executed, or is it the third one? Well, I have no clue, basically, right? Maybe you can find out according to the name, but in that case, the name is null. That's not going to help me a lot. And essentially, it's really hard to debug these kind of things. So what I recommend when you debug, when you create your stuff, try to run one at a time, or else you're going to lose your sanity. So essentially what I do is that here I would put uh, nice comments, and then I would probably deploy to production and forget to remove it, so don't do that either. That's why we have two eyes, con <laughs> you know, two eyes, uh, oh, sorry, four eyes, two, two people, four eyes uh, uh, concept. Well, basically, don't forget to remove that because that's going to mess everything up. But at least if I run this code now, it's going to run just one call of my activity function, and then it allows me to really understand what's going on. When I'm happy, then I go back, and then I remove that uh, before I deploy to production. Okay? So be careful with these kind of things, but really, that can be really tricky to develop and to debug. All right, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you today. So we talked about functions, and ooh, wow. We did a brief recapitulation about Azure Function. We, understand, we understood where do functions come from, but also some of the limitations that they have. And then we understood why do we want to use durable functions to overcome those limitations. We understood how those uh, durable functions work. By the way, I didn't mention that, but it's actually pretty clever how it's done. It's an extension component that you add to your function application. So initially, when they were first released, your function applications didn't have the durable function part, but you could add it. Now it's pretty much there from the start. So when you create a new function application in Visual Studio, it's going to be already configured to run durable functions. So it's way easier. Then we saw those patterns, all right? The function chaining, the fan out, fan in, those two patterns that you're going to use a lot, but you can also monitor things or wait on things using this. And then we saw those tips and tricks, errors I made and that I hope you never make. If you want to learn more about Azure Functions, this is a place where you can go. It's our learn um, space on Microsoft. You don't need an Azure account to go there. It doesn't cost you anything. We give you some sandbox where you can actually deploy your Azure Function. 
It's going to last for two hours, and then after that, we discard everything. So it's a good place. Don't try to go and use that for Bitcoin mining. We actually detect that, and we prevent that from happening. Uh, just to be clear, but if you want to learn, this is really a great place to go. So you can absolutely go and use that. And finally, this is uh, what you need. So this is where you get the slides and all the resource code. So this is really the, the URL that you want. The one saying durable functions pattern at the, at the bottom there, this is where you can go and see all those other patterns, the monitor one, the human interaction one, etc., etc. And finally, this is me. So if you want to come and talk to me, say hi, please do so. I'm going to be here the whole day. I'm going to flying back home tomorrow. And uh, hopefully this was useful for you. My name is Owen Bignot. I'm a cloud advocate for Microsoft. Thank you so much for your attention and have a great day. So I guess I did finish a little bit early. So if you have a question, I can take it and I'm going to repeat it for the people. I just said, Tori, that I didn't have question, but you know, I, sometimes I'm, I'm like this. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does the two-minute one cost more? Or? No. Uh, I mean, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Basically, we bill you by the execution time, okay, and by the second. So if you run a function for two seconds, it's going to be cheaper to run than if, you, if they run for two minutes. But however, we do have in the... Oh, by the way, the question for my online audience was, what is the difference between those functions if they run for two seconds or two minutes? Is there a difference? Well, yeah, obviously the two-minute one is going to cost more. We bill you by the second. Um, however, um, there is also a generous free tier, and there, is, there are good chances that a lot of what you do, especially during the development part, but also during the startup phase of your application, when you don't have so many users, is going to fall into that free tier, so you're not going to pay. We start billing, I can't remember exactly, but there is a, there is a number of execution where we start billing. Uh, if you want to have more information about that, we have the, uh, the keyword is Azure Pricing Calculator where you can go. But essentially, there is no difference in the way that those are handled. The difference is that the ones that last longer are going to cost more. That's really what it is. Plus, we build you a little bit for the storage. So if you use storage uh, to store the state, like in that case, or to store just the code of your function, then it's going to cost you a little bit. This is cents per month, so it's not much. OK? Cool. I guess we have uh, one more question, maybe. Well, everything was clear, so time for coffee after two sessions in a row. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, hope it was useful. Thank you. <laughs>